It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Phil Evans, and he's the artistic director of the Complete Works Company. And I just want to go down memory lane for a minute. I, uh, I first met Phil when we were both studying for an MA in Drama and Theatre Studies at Royal Holloway, and that was in the early 1990s. <coughs> Uh, we were also, at the time, both teaching in secondary schools. Well, on the MA, we were required, as part of the course, to be writers and directors, and we had to also act in each other's productions. Um, well, Phil had trained as an actor, so that meant he got most of the leading parts. <laughs> uh, I well remember that there was a very strange production of King Lear. He played the lead. Uh, there was an even more amazing version of the melodrama, The Bells, which I wrote or adapted the script for, and uh, he played the lead. <laughs> And how well I remember him <laughs> casting me as old man with pipe. <laughs> uh, when, as the playwright, I remember thinking at the time that I deserved something a little more exciting. <laughs> um, but as we worked together more and more, I found out that Phil um, had somewhat fallen into teaching, but that for teaching for him was not something he did merely to supplement his, in, his acting income. I discovered that he had a real passion for working with young people as a drama teacher, and that was in a very challenging school. Um, later, following the MA, he was appointed as head of drama at the Brit School, um, which is a specialist, as you probably know, a specialist performing arts school. Uh, I think there are some people from the Brit School here this evening. And um, he built, in his time there, he built a strong and innovative department. After that, he joined a well-established theatre and education company as a writer, director and actor. And finally, and some of us felt not before time, he set up his own creative company. Um, but all through that career, Phil has worked with young people excluded from mainstream education on a one-to-one -one basis and the skills that he's developed over those years have served him well. I think it's fair to say that the ethos of the Complete Works company derives from him. His tutors come from a wide range of backgrounds and are representative of all branches of the creative arts and education and some of my own PGCE students have worked in Phil's company. The Complete Works takes an innovative approach to tutoring and working creatively through the arts with young people who are outside the mainstream and also they work projects with schools and so on. Um, as an ex-school teacher himself, Phil understands the need to work in a positive, productive way um, with the different institutions. It's not always easy, but for the good of the young people who pass through the uh, metaphorical doors of the complete works. <coughs> it's his ability to bring together the young people at the heart of his work with those in the arts, teachers in schools, social workers and so on, which continues to make the complete work such a success story. And the company is now coming up to its 10 year celebrations in July. Mm. In a moment, Phil is going to tell you about some of the achievements of the Complete Works over the last 10 years and about what lies ahead. For Phil himself, I know that he has recently reactivated his equity card. Um, so he may be thinking of restarting his acting career. Although his more recent forays into writing and directing have provided him with a new focus. Also during this year, Phil has had the opportunity to work with some of the PGCE students at Goldsmiths as a visiting tutor. Um, he's run a drama session for the PGCE secondary English students, many of whom are here tonight. Uh, he also has run a series of voice workshops for the flexible PGCE students. And I have to tell you, it's a joy to go into one of Phil's voice workshop sessions. I've witnessed him 
persuade all the students, whether they're from science or community languages or English subject areas, to recite poems dramatically to each other as a way of gaining confidence in the classroom situation. <coughs> and the students in that situation give each other massive support. So if anything sums fill up, it is this enviable ability to establish an inclusive and unselfconscious learning environment for adults and young people alike. But enough of me being nice about him, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to the man himself now. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what an introduction, gosh. I have to say that your, um, your Stanislavskian methodology that you applied to the uh, old man with the pipe was absolutely <laughs> exemplary. It's a very big sense. Uh, absolutely. You needed to be there, though. You really need to be there. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming tonight. It's, it's such a hot night, and, uh, you know, I've tried to well, leave the doors open, shall we, because um, I think just get a bit of air going through. Uh, if anybody sort of looks like they're flagging, go, put your hand up. I've got some water here. Okay. Right. I prepared quite a long, a lot of things to say. I'm probably going to go off script halfway through because I, I do find it hard to sort of lecture. It's not usually the format I do, and um, I'm kind of a bit suited and booted. But I'll I'll do my best to be uh, cut through the formality of this and be able to actually talk to you directly, which is kind of the only way I can actually be. Well, I'll begin. I've yet to meet a young person who doesn't want to learn. That's the first statement I'm going to make. It might seem quite a big statement to make, essentially, considering the amount of young people who are continually out of mainstream education, but I have yet to meet a young person who doesn't want to learn. I think seeking to acquire knowledge and understanding is a natural human condition. It's part of a human being's evolutionary development. We can't help but want to make sense of the world. It's what motivates us to get out of bed in the morning. So why aren't the schools full of eager young people ready to learn? Many of the young people who had referred to the complete works for mentoring and tuition say they don't want to learn. They don't want to make sense of the world. And they certainly don't want to get out of bed in the morning either. And I know that young people are notoriously difficult for get, getting them out of bed for any reason, but. But for those that we deal with, the reluctance to face the world isn't simply due to laziness or, or the party the night before. There's other circumstances in the mix, and other things need to be considered. So I'd like us to create an imaginary profile of a young person that could be referred to TCW, that's what we call the complete works, for mentoring and tuition. Outline a number of reasons why they may have rejected learning, and explore some of the ways in which we could attempt to motivate them to engage. While I realise I'll have to be somewhat, and have to sort of generalise about character traits and simplify the scenarios, I think that the exercise would be quite beneficial in helping us to explore the methods that the company might use to achieve its aims. Before I ask you to offer suggestions, however, I think it's important to explain the company's referral process and how a young person gets to work with us in the first place. The majority of referrals come through social services. We have a simple referral form, we're trying to make it as simple as possible, don't we? In which it's completed by the young person's social worker or key worker, and it describes the reasons why they've been excluded from mainstream education. The form documents the amount of hours they're wishing to commission from us, and the content they'd like us to include in tu tuition or in mentoring. We actually don't make a big deal between tuition and mentoring because ultimately when we get young people that come to us, sometimes mentoring is the first thing we can actually do. But we can't help but want to slip in education as we go along. So we, I, you're going to hear me say tuition and mentoring as if it's like one thing, but they do kind of merge. So requests are also made <coughs> according to the specific educational and vocational needs of the young person so that a detailed plan can be put in place for the tutor mentor to implement. Hours are commissioned and they range from two to about 25 hours a week. So we might sometimes find that we have to cover a wide range of activities 
and engage more than one tutor mentor to work with the young person. So, with the referral process in place, let's try and create the student profile. You can have the next uh, picture, please. This is the interactive bit. So, this it could be male or female, I think, I'm not too sure. A short haired person. Okay, and Simone, the lovely Simone. I'd say the lovely Debbie McGee. Okay. Um, she's going to write down a few ideas so we can actually imagine that there's a real person here. So, can we have a name, please? It doesn't have to be your actual name, but a name of a person. Derek. Derek. So it obviously looks very male, okay? <laughs> Derek. We'll just call him Derek for confidential reasons because we don't want everybody to know who Derek is. Okay. <coughs> I hope that's how he spells his I name. Okay. Yeah, he has it that way. Does he have it that way? Yeah, it's a bit, cool a bit awkward, name. that Derek, obviously. Okay, um, good. <laughs> what age is Derek, please? Somebody call out an age. Oh, now he's a young person. And I, I, like, I like that because I'm older, older than 21 and I still think I'm a young person. But... He's 15 is about right, um, and that helps me to realise that in my notes I didn't say basically that the majority of the young people are between about 11 to about 16, something like that. So Derek's 15. Okay. Where does he live? Peckham. <laughs> Not that we're stereotyping at all. <laughs> Poor old Dan comes from Peckham over there. Brixton. Oh, we've got Peckham. It's okay. It's in Peckham now. Yeah. Peckham stroke Brixton. We don't want to go anymore with any more stereotypes, otherwise nobody will want to live there. Okay. So that's, that's, that's where he lives. Okay. Is he living with his parents? Has he got siblings? Is he, li he lives with his dad. Grand. Oh, with his grand. Okay, with his grand. Where I got dad from. Okay, so he lives with his gran. Why does he live with his gran, I wonder? What's wrong with his mum and dad? Why doesn't he live with his mum and dad? Any ideas? Because these are the reasons for why he's been referred to us. Because his mum's in prison. His mum's in prison. Now we're kicking into it. You see, we've got a tutor who's ringing back here. That's great. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. My mum's in prison and his father is unknown. Okay. Father unknown. Okay. Well, we're just making this up, but it could be absolutely real. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know whether anybody thought that you know, this is going to be kind of shocking or difficult or could, this could really happen, but this is an easy case, really, from some of the people that we get referred to as, unfortunately. Um, so he's been excluded from school, I imagine, and what on earth has he done? What? He kicked the teacher. Good for him. Okay. <laughs> I won't ask where. <laughs> okay. In Peckham. In Peckham. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> or Brixton. Okay. okay. Are there any other issues that are impacting upon this, apart from the impact of the kick? <laughs> Anything else that we've got to consider? Hang on, I got two things at once, yes. Uh, he doesn't have any money. No. That's quite off, uh, you know, probably quite possible at 15 as well. He's got no money. Okay, yes. He's got S uh, special educational needs. He's got special educational needs. What sort of special education? Um, Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Right, oh, she's not going to write all that down, is she? <laughs> You're just awkward, aren't you? You invite it, I'll get your name later. <laughs> <laughs> From Peckham, no doubt. Okay. okay. So, why did he kick his teacher, I wonder? Any ideas? Frustrated, yeah. She called him an idiot. That wasn't very professional, was it? I can't imagine any teacher doing that. <laughs> she called him an idiot. Okay. Um, well, maybe, I mean, I don't know what you reckon the scenario is. And it's, it's, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is just build up this so that when we get to talk about these people, that you kind of have a real pe person in your mind, really. That it's not just some uh, hypothetical, because this is very real, isn't it, Andy? I mean, you deal with some young people who've got far more, I mean, this would be... 
<laughs> is it easy? Uh, not that anything is easy, actually, because this is, these are the things that have happened to Derek. These are the things we know about. These are the things, if people filled them in, would be on the referral form, wouldn't it, really? Um, and basically, they would then say, well, what we'd like him to learn is some, um, some maths and some English and maybe some science. And what else would they ask, do you think? I don't know. Um, National curriculum. Yeah, national curriculum. But we wouldn't get anything else. We wouldn't get um, probably a national curriculum level. We wouldn't get any folders of work that he'd done in uh, and done any work in. We'd like to do, wouldn't we? <laughs> Sorry, I've just got somebody over here who refers. I think I might have to go home. <laughs> But we then have to kind of, in a sense, make sense of this. And we want to motivate this young person to learn. We want to get them to re-engage with education. Okay? And it's very difficult. These are, the, these are the things that have risen to the surface. These are the things that we know about. But an awful lot more has happened to that young person inside themselves than we actually can ever see. So, okay, we've got all this. This is a referral form. It's great. Let's try and keep this in our minds. And we'll move further on. <laughs> Um, I'll go back to my little speech, okay? okay? Thank you very much for the lovely Simone. Thank you. Thank you. So having established the circumstances in which the young person finds themselves in, let's now consider how the Complete Works endeavours to support them to re-engage with education. I have to say, however, if I had to face half the problems that the young people face on a daily basis, I'm not too sure I want to get out of bed either to face the world. One of the most important things I feel that we've learnt over the past 10 years in which the company has been working with young people is that we should always try and discriminate between what a young person says they want and then what they demonstrate that they want. You see, they, make, they might say that they don't want to learn, but then that's often a way of them trying to gain some form of control over what might seem as a very, very difficult and, and very, very powerless situation. And saying no is powerful. The first time you say no to authority, it may be frightening and a little bit difficult for you, but if you stick your ground, you find you have power. It may be a somewhat negative type of power, but it's power all the same. And if you keep on saying no, you get to discover where no takes you. Even though you find the consequences of your action to be totally undesirable, it can often feel better to endure than to conform to authority. Because you have caused others to act on your no command. You also realize that although this might result in your liberty being totally taken away from you, people can't actually make you do anything that you don't want to do. And this can be a revelation. And by the same token, the people on the receiving end of your continual no chant eventually have to realize that they have to change. They have to change their own tactics because the strategies they've employed to control you so far <laughs> they no longer work. So if we work with the premise that they're not actually saying no to learning, then why are they saying no? And what are they actually saying no to? Oh, and by the way, they may not actually use the word no either. They'll probably find far more creative ways of saying no, <laughs> like throwing a chair across the room, for instance, or smashing a window, or hurting uh, somebody else, or even hurting themselves. Or they might say something like, this is boring, which, or I don't want to do anything, which is actually worse than throwing a chair across the room, because at least when they're throwing a chair across the room, they show they care. <laughs> what they're more likely to be saying no to through these creative demonstrations of anger and frustration is the authority which actually says to them, whether they like it or not, that they've got to go to school. Can we have the next picture, please? Look at this lovely place. It's not in England, that school, actually. It's somewhere in America. Um, it's a bit of an ant's nest to me, really. Um, I decided to use this picture um, of an American school rather than an English one, so nobody recognized it. <laughs> and I could protect the innocent. Um, I 
you might ask, why shouldn't they go to school? Everyone has to go to school. They make friends there. It's not only beneficial from the point of view of education, it's good in developing their social skills. It also gets them out of the house and off the streets. And it's the law anyway, and they should jolly well do what they're told. But for the young people who have had similar experiences to the profile that we've just created, school represents far more than simply a place of learning about the world and socialising with friends. Many of the young people referred to us have experienced incredibly, incredibly traumatic breakdowns in their family situation, sometimes involving, in, involving abuse, sometimes drugs misuse, sometimes prostitution, crimes involving knives, guns. Not only has the family group they belong to broken apart, but they have also lost any trust they might have had in adults and their ability to present positive role models or to act as competent parents and guardians. So now this traumatised youth is expected to integrate into a large educational institution like this one. Interact on a wide range of social groupings and form positive relationships with their peers and with adults in authority. As you can easily imagine, unless this young person has superhuman powers, it's really not going to happen. This is in fact a recipe for disaster. Once a young person is placed in this particular setting, and with all these ingredients in place, the result is equivalent to a significantly dangerous bomb. And it's only a matter of time before it explodes, causing catastrophic damage. You might remember I explained the referral process earlier, where requests are made regarding a young person's specific educational and vocational needs, and how a detailed plan is then put in place for the tutor mentor to implement. Well, in actual fact, once that metaphorical bomb I've described to you has fully exploded, it's not unusual for the young person's social worker to bypass this formal documentation altogether and in desperation pick up the phone and say something like, for heaven's sake, is there anything you can do with this kid? I don't think you know about that. <laughs> She's very good. Very good. So what do we do with them? Well, I can tell you what we don't do with them. And that's to turn up first thing in the morning and say, right, get up, it's time for algebra. That's really not the way we start. Um, and actually, there's no one specific way uh, to reignite a young person's interest in education. You kind of often have to feel your way slowly, building up trust and working according to the direction that the young person's actually taking you in. Much has to be screened out at the start as language and behaviour may leave quite a lot to be desired. And the ground rules may take quite a while to implement. However, it's essential that the professional boundaries, of course, are in place. You know you're, you're friendly, but you're not their friend. And it's always clear that you are, in a sense, there on trust, creating a good role model, trying to build up their confidence. And then, once the trust and respect has been established, then you can begin to search for that creative key. The key which kind of unlocks the door to learning, opens the gate to imagination, and give acts, gives access to the tools used to create. It's the sound. It sounds quite mysterious and magical, but it's actually not. It's simply just the one thing that the young person finds resonates with their thoughts and emotions. It awakens their own creativity. It's a piece of music that gets their foot tapping. It's a story that makes them laugh, the poem which makes them sad. It's the film which makes them angry, or, or the painting that causes them to reflect. Basically, it's anything which can cut through that vortex that they've created around themselves, get under their skin and stir up their creative juices, motivating them to produce their own original ideas. The complete work states its aims as to reignite people's interest in education through creativity. But what does that statement actually mean? I often think it conjures up an image of tutors turning up at sessions dressed as kind of court jesters and singing and dancing chapters from Jane Eyre or juggling multicolored balls to explain how the planets revolve in, this, in space. Can I have the next picture, please? <laughs> there we are, that kind of thing. She's not here tonight, Fran, is she? 
Um, yeah, that is Fran. She, she's, a, she's gone and run away and joined the circus now, but she did work for us at one time. You can see why she, the circus had her, can't you? Really? <laughs> well, thankfully, that's not really what it's like at all. <clears throat> Although I must admit, we're quite likely to go with any creative idea whatsoever that would give us half a chance of getting a young person to engage, no matter how off the wall it might seem. Perhaps the best way to explain how we work is to go right back to the very beginning, to the first person that I particularly myself tutored and the time that I incorporated the company, ten years ago. At that time, social services asked me to work with a young person called Darren. Can I have the next picture, please? And I was engaged, actually, to help him to read his mail. There he is. He's a bit older there. Um, he... Uh, I think he was about, oh, I don't know, Duncan, when you interviewed him, I think he was about 22, 23, something like that. Well, when I started with him, he was 19, and his reading age was seven at the time. Um, we met once a week for two hours, and given that he lived alone, one-to-one -one sessions had to take place in a public place. So we, we never tutor when we're on our own with a young person in a house, obvious, for obvious reasons. And... Uh, in order to safeguard our, our professional relationship, we had to find a sort of public space to work in. The library was often a very difficult place to work, uh, as it was important that he should be able to read out loud. <laughs> and after a while, I was given a room in a nearby social services office. To, be, to begin with, it seemed that there was no other place to go to but to the local cafe. The cafe was one of those easy-going places where customers could spend an eternity relaxing over never-ending cups of coffee and thumbing through a large collection of newspapers scattered around the tables. At the time, Darren said he learnt more about cappuccinos and baguettes and croissants than he did about English, but the actual truth was, <laughs> she's laughing because she's heard that one before, um, the actual truth was that it was there that Darren's confidence in reading really began to develop. There was headlines in the papers and, the, and they'd spark off discussions about current political or social issues and affairs, and, and I would con convince Darren to read articles to me claiming that I'd forgotten my glasses. <laughs> well, he would have to read out loud then, wouldn't he? And in public, he knew what I was playing at, actually, but he kind of did it all the same. He played along with it. We were in public. We be began with reading The Sun. Now, I don't know, but you only need a reading age of eight to read The Sun. <laughs> Um, but we went, went on later on to The Voice, and, and we actually had an aspiration of The Guardian. I never knew whether we actually got there. But we would read anything that literally was there. So you talk about resources, those were our resources. And many of the young people that we actually work with are motivated by urban music, and Darren was certainly no exception. He was totally devoted to a, a, an urban band called the Wu-Tang Clan. I don't know if you know about wu -Tang Clan, but I know lots now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as the sessions developed, we began to study Shakespeare. And that was my bit. And it wasn't too long before we discovered that the Bard and the Wu have quite a lot in common. <laughs> Absolutely sure. Creating provocative images through words is important to both. And it's easy to see how the Wu-Tang's use of speech and rhythm works in a similar way to Shakespeare's use of verse and prose. Both employ similar methods to keep the kind of rhythmic counterpoint of their language alive, and they both look to maintain the focus of the audience's attention by moving through the two. Darren became fascinated. <laughs> so did I, actually, at the time. He became fascinated with the language and the rhythm, and, and consequently, sessions began to involve rapping the most famous monologues from Shakespeare's plays. He, began, he became particularly inspired by Henry V's speech to his troops. And uh, towards the end of our sessions together, Darren would confidently wrap this speech in public. He was constantly booked to perform a number of social services conferences and events and parties. <laughs> <laughs> he was quite a celebrity, I tell you. And he later won a place in drama college using it as an audition speech. It was, uh, it was, was quite moving, I have to say. Well, during my tuition sessions, I drew inspiration from theatre to motivate young people. 
my background is in theatre, as Maggie's just told you all, and uh, my drama school training did help me a great deal to communicate on a number of different levels. But as other tutors and mentors signed up to work with me, they then introduced other creative disciplines, widening the skills base of the company and giving us a greater range of tools to get the young people to engage. So, the company grew from somewhat one-man show into a large ensemble of actors, musicians, filmmakers, artists of all types, offering a multitude of methods and techniques to enable the young people to learn. However, this is not the complete story, so to speak. It's a joke in there, but nobody can <laughs> As no company can truly develop without a strong infrastructure to support and coordinate tutors and mentors, operate effective reporting systems, and maintain, fa maintain financial control. This was initially created and developed by, by, by my, um, my co-founder and partner, Neil Powney. Let me just have the next one, please. So um, that was a portrait um, that was uh, commissioned about, oh gosh, yes, I suppose 15 years ago. The portrait was commissioned before Neil and I started the company. And as a financial director, it was Neil's usual job to curb my spending. And uh, from the look on his face, actually, it seems that's exactly what's being discussed here. <laughs> um, the usual scenario was that I would pretend to sulk if I didn't get what I wanted. I still do it, don't I, Sanjay? He's our accountant now. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd sulk if I didn't get my way, and he would try and maintain this stubborn composure while secretly thinking of a way that he could support me to achieve my aims. <coughs> Sadly, Neil died just before the company's fifth anniversary, but his spirit lives on. And indeed, without the structure with, with which the TCW team, the trustees and patrons provide, I'm sure we couldn't support young people to succeed half as well as we do. And thank you, everybody from the team coming here tonight, the Chrissy, my deputy, and, the, the, and I'll introduce you all to everybody later on, and the trustees. Thank you. So the next photograph, please. One-to-one -one tuition. A little bit staged, but it's actually going on now, really. <laughs> I said to looking, look, you know, try and look as if you're really working, which is good. <laughs> no, it was really working. <laughs> the company now employs about 50 to 60 tutors and mentors who work on a one-to-one -one basis and in small groups with approximately 100 young people every month. We had about three to three and a half thousand hours of tuition this last month. That's a hell of a lot, isn't it, really? No wonder we're tired. <laughs> <laughs> they have a, a wide range of experience and qualifications, and they draw from the creative st skills that they've acquired to motivate young people to learn. Some have PGCE qualifications and some don't. We consider the most important factors to have, actually, that tutors and mentors are creative, that they can communicate well, and they can work on one-to-one -one situations. You see, working one-to-one -one can often be, often be quite intensive. You can never say to, to, to the young person that you're working with, now work in groups, or do things in your folders for 20 minutes. You're actually, in effect, solely working from the front all the way through that two hours that you're working with them. And you can actually feel or hear the, the kind of creative cogs of learning beginning to turn when you're in that one-to-one -one intensive situation. To support staff, we run regular in-service training. And tutors and mentors are kept up to speed with company developments and new innovations and policies in education. We're also planning to run a course soon, which through the Open College Network will give tutors and mentors a qualification in working on a one-to-one -one basis so that they can develop those skills. The tutor and mentor's aim is always to, in a sense, make themselves redundant. As where possible, they'll endeavour, actually, to help the young person to return to mainstream education. It's really where we'd like them to be. If it's considered that the young person will be able to go back to school and thrive in that school environment, then the tutor and mentor will work to achieve its aim. They will accompany the young person to school, support them in class, and then pull out slowly, continuing to support them after school until they're kind of fully reintegrated, if that's at all possible. 
However, as I mentioned earlier, for some of the young people that we work with, school may never be the answer, actually. More and more, we're being asked to replace rather than to supplement mainstream education. Ten years ago, the ma maximum number of hours we'd be asked to be commissioned to work with a single young person in one week might be ten. But nowadays, it's more like 25 in one week. So we're actually replacing mainstream education. We're actually replacing the curriculum. And with these amounts of hours commissioned, it's clear that a full timetable would need to be created, which would also key as much as possible into the national curriculum. <coughs> For this to take place, a number of tutor mentors should be employed to work with each individual young person to ensure a range of subjects and activities are covered. Where possible, we'll make attempts to tutor the young people in small group situations. <laughs> Although this has got to be done quite carefully. We don't want to undo the trust that's already been built up in a one-to-one -one situ situation already. And we, we have that trust between the tutor and the mentor, so we try and keep that as much as we possibly can. An effective way often of, of integrating young people into the group dynamic is to allow the tutor mentors to remain supporting their own individual students until such a time as they feel that they can slowly retreat. And in this scenario, the group may begin to operate with as many tutor mentors as there are students to begin with. However, the intention will then be to slowly remove some of them one by one until actual group tuition can truly take place. On the next slide so we can see that, please. So this was taken quite recently, and as you can see that um, everybody's got their own tutor. But in a sense we're working in groups, and, and sometimes they can carousel around, and sometimes we might tentatively pull one out and have a little bit of group tuition happening. I say tentatively because there, there's quite a bond build up, built, built up. For those students who are able to work in small groups, it's important that we give them opportunities to interact on a number of levels. So, we've recently joined forces uh, with another organisation called Plan B. We're able to offer life coaching and sports activities alongside the tuition and mentoring work that we do. Combining creative learning, life coaching, academic subjects, sports activities and social skills together incidentally spells class. We're trying to be a bit clever there, but anyway. You know, de reclassifying education, taking the class out of the classroom. We've tried all of that, haven't we? Uh, well, we're able to give students a fully rounded experience. For all students to spend a significant period of time with us, whether they're working in a one-to-one -one <coughs> or a small group situation, I guess the most important questions to consider are what are they likely to achieve by working with us? And what are they likely to be left with when they leave us? It's important that students have an opportunity to achieve to a high standard and that they have evidence that their achievements with us are as valid as those that they might receive in a mainstream setting. As a virtual school, so to speak, it's difficult to run our operation as an actual school might run. And, and actually, what would be the point of that anyway? Uh, the object of the exercise is not to simply recreate something the young people have already rejected. And not only that, it's important to explode the perception that these young people are simply being rewarded for being excluded from mainstream education. You know, having a jolly good time. Uh, doing exactly what they want. Kicking a ball about. Play acting every day. I don't actually particularly care if the young people get that perception. In fact, it's very important that they do see themselves as having a jolly good time. The more successful learning can take place if they are in a happy and relaxed state of mind. While they're having fun, they're more likely to be receptive to what is on offer to them, and consequently be more readily able to imbibe knowledge and enhance their skills. In fact, knowledge is more likely to be acquired when it's not exactly focused on. And by stimulating the young person's creativity, to become naturally inquisitive to the subject matter on offer. I often say that the best method of tutoring, and I think I've said it for 10 years, so she must be fed up with this now, but anyway, get their creative juices flowing and then just slip literacy and numeracy under the door when they're not looking, is what I tend to say. And that's what we try to do. Wherever we possibly can, 
try and motivate them because you know uh, we've had some young people initially I'm remembering one that was, was in our office one day and um, I said to him what do you like doing now? Nothing. Yeah. Okay well what interests you? Nothing. Wow okay great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, would you, um, you like any music? It's all right. Oh well, good. It's all right. That's a, that's a key. Get in there, you know. It's all right. Okay. Well, uh, do you like break dancing? It's all right. Oh, we're doing some break dancing across the road. Actually, we're doing some kickboxing as well. We're doing all sorts of creative stuff. This kid got into kickboxing first, and then he got a, a yellow belt, I think, from that, and then he got into break dancing, and then he he, he, he won a partly won a competition. And then he really engaged and he was really interested in stuff. And then we said to him, so you're interested in two things. Is there anything else you'd like to do? And he said, well, um, I've been thinking actually, because we were communicating quite well by this point. I'd like to do GCSE maths. We don't normally get it as good as that. <laughs> normally we kind of work our way up. But that's an absolutely true um, situation. And... Uh, yeah, he, I mean, he did go on to greater things. I don't know what's happened to him since that, but um, I don't know. It turned him on. If it turned him on to academic subjects, math, for heaven's sake, we would have been happy if he'd have just sort of said, I'd like to learn to, I know, I don't know who Dickens was. Actually, that'd be quite a lot, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, what would we be happy with? Oh, I don't know. We'd be happy with if he was just interested in reading something. Anyway. Going off the script, can't know where I am now. So, um, what are we able to leave young people with when they start working with us? Ideally, I think they should leave us with a good understanding of the world and the society they live in, a substantial acquirement of knowledge, a range of well-developed skills, a sense of self-worth, a good degree of confidence and an aspiration to continue to learn and develop. How's about that? <laughs> I can't imagine anybody would argue that it'd be helpful for young people to acquire as many of those attributes as possible. In fact, I think we'd actually live in a, live in a much better society if a few more people had that as well. However, it's got to be said that unfortunately these attributes are actually still not enough. Gaining knowledge, understanding and skills is of paramount importance. Yet without the evidence that it's been achieved, the young person is unable to move forward. By this, I mean, of course, that they, if they're going to get on in the world, they need qualifications. We, we conduct tests to ascertain a young person's reading and spelling age. We find their levels of literacy and numeracy. We write considerably detailed reports on our students' achievements. And we also award young people with certificates of attendance and document their activities that each student has been involved in and the content of the work that they've covered during their sessions with us. And although these documents are very valuable proof that constructive educational tuition has taken place and certain goals have been achieved, they'll often still not be enough to open the next educational door. What are actually needed, which should make a significant difference, are nationally recognised qualifications. And this often means, of course, they've got to sit exams. Welcome to the world. Can we have the next one, please? Quite proud of this, actually. This is our students sitting exams. Here they are. That was we finished our last um, GCSE exam this morning, actually, in maths. And um, a select little group. And to just, if there's anybody from the AQA here, I took that after they'd finished the exam. I didn't disturb them. I just said, continue on. We've got five more minutes. <laughs> In that kind of voice. I had quick, you know, squeaky shoes and I did, I did all the proper exam stuff. At one time, we would work with an excluded young person outside the school setting and then hope to renegotiate with the school to allow them back to sit their exams. Although this seems a perfectly reasonable solution, it was often fraught with problems. Schools would often consider that the students that they've excluded should not re-enter the school. It'd be difficult for them to reintegrate because for the short time they'd actually be sitting the exams, it would be difficult for them to work with other students. 
It's often considered to be in the best interest of the excluded young person and the remaining pupils that they shouldn't mix at a very stressful time. And while these reasons are somewhat sound, it's hard not to also take into consideration that by allowing these students back to sit their exams, schools do kind of also run the risk of having their league tables affected. Wouldn't want to be too um, political about that, but it, it, if these students do manage to gain some A to C grades, they'll clearly not be able to sit the whole range of subject exams on offer. And schools, you know, like five A to Cs, don't they? I can understand that. But once the kid's been thrown out, that's, that's the end of it, really. So we had to try and find some sorts of ways that we can still get them education qualifications. You might say, it serves them right. They should have thought of that before they got themselves excluded. But exactly how long are we going to punish them for their misdemeanours? And should we deny them the opportunity to gain access to education, training and employment? As a matter of fact, these young people are actually in a very vulnerable situation at this time. And to prohibit them from gaining access to further develop their skills could result in the rejection of, their, of the entire system. The result of this policy can often be that those who have been excluded from school today become those who are excluded from society tomorrow. Without a sense of belonging to a positive and supportive group, they're more likely to search for their identity in gangs. It's easy to see that it would be far more cost effective to support these young people at this point than to wait until they present totally unreasonable and antisocial behaviour and then in turn to fund institutions which will ultimately lock them away. Thankfully, as I've just pointed out, we've now been able to register the complete works with the Assessment and Qualifications Alliance, which in short is the AQA exam board. As a result, we can award AQA units and students are able to sit their exams with us for English and Maths at entry level and at GCSE. And as I say, this was, it was last week actually, but this morning I, I, I faced them again, reluctantly sitting their exams, but they did it. And the tutors who work with them on a one-to-one -one basis with students, they liaise with our qualifications coordinator, who attends the board standardization meeting, and ensures that the exams are run in accordance with the regulations. Exam papers are stored in the safe, and such a time that they're needed, and they're securely driven to a nearby approved venue. It's the local uh, community centre called Rich Mix. Students arrive accompanied by their tutors, have a coffee, it's all very nice and sort of very civilised. They sit their exams at the appointed time along with the rest of the country. And this system runs very effectively. Everyone's happy. And not only that, I get to be called head teacher, which is really very good for my team. <laughs> Alongside this, we do, of course, still recognise and celebrate achievements, which may not necessarily be part of the national curriculum. Jack Petchy Award Scheme, for instance, gives us the opportunity to not only present awards to students, but also to tutors and mentors as well. And their certificates and medals, which are given at the Jack Petchy Award Ceremonies, um, serve to raise self-esteem and, and they can really help a great deal to open doors to career development. Last one, please. This is the kind of graffiti logo. Wu Tang would be proud, wouldn't they? <laughs> As I pointed out near the start of the lecture, the Complete Works was initially incorporated with the aim to reignite the interest in education through creativity. Over the past 10 years, we've done our level best to achieve this, and we'll continue to look for new and innovative ways to work towards this aim in the years to come. Alongside the one-to-one -one and small group tuition and mentoring we offer, we offer, operate, I think, some very successful theatre, music and film projects, workshops and courses. We have partnerships with both state and private schools, and we take a bridge Shakespeare plays into schools and run Shakespeare masterclasses in association with the Italia Conti Academy. We also run a very successful community theatre project which involves the high ability uh, Italia Conti students working with students with severe disabilities and difficulties from a school called Richard Cloudsley, which is in, in Golden Lane in London. 
So the high ability and the people with disabilities work together. Um, and they, they do drama and, they, and, and stage productions and presentation. And it's really difficult to ascertain who learns the most from who in that situation. It's, it's, it's a fantastic sort of synthesis. We also operate workshops which use puppetry, mask work, DJ and rap. You see, I haven't quite lost the DJ and rap. Mm -hmm. uh, and we stage productions focusing on issues such as anti-bullying, gangs, and we run film projects in primary, secondary, and special needs schools. We work in pupil referral units, community centres, anywhere they'll have us, basically. <laughs> in addition, we run consultation events, which gives young people uh, who are in the care of the local authority a, a voice. A voice in shaping the service that they receive from what is known as their corporate parents. In one-to-one -one uh, consultation events, uh, we often try and, and look at real issues and try and see if we can, in a sense, put people in each other's shoes so we can see things from different points of view. Um, one thing we did, I'm reminded of, um, is we got a young person and we gave her the job of being a social worker for a day. And uh, we put her in a social services office and, and got her to look at how difficult it was to be a social worker. My God, she certainly, on camera later on, said how difficult that was. The cases that we gave her were, obviously, were, they, were, they were made up because we had to be quite confidential, but we actually ran it like a real uh, situation, working in office. But we didn't stop there either. Um, we tried to juxtapose this by um, taking a social worker and we put her in care for 24 hours in a children's home, and that was even more revealing. Um, <clears throat> she broke down after a few hours and wanted to go home and found it incredibly difficult and, uh, and really, you know, she was safe and secure. She didn't have any of the, the worries or the problems that some of these young people had impacting on their lives. I hope I've given you some idea of the work we do and the methods that we employ. Uh, we don't always manage to achieve our aims, but we do our damnedest to make a difference and if we can, I have to say that, well, it's, it's really worth it, it's lovely, it's a very rewarding job, it, it's something I like to get out of bed in the morning to do anyway. And it's so fantastic when occasionally we get a bit of feedback and we get a, a, a parent or a guardian or a social worker on the other end of the phone actually, you know, giving us some positive feedback. Yeah, you know, it might just be, yeah, they're back in school and, and they're doing really well, or it might just be... It might be even more emotional that we've actually had people crying on the phone and saying, we've got our son back, or something like that. That's lovely. And we all have a little bit of a moment, don't we? <laughs> okay. Well, I've come to the end. <laughs> I've run out. Um, and we're going to go on to questions and answers uh, in a moment. Um, so we'll turn to that. I don't. Oh, look at that. It's 7 o'clock. I thought I'd timed it, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, we're going to we're going to see a film though now, aren't we? It's not Star Trek or anything like that, unfortunately. Although I know we've got a Trekkie in our midst, but um, <laughs> so this will be in, not just old man with pipe. Okay, um, so we're going to watch this film. It's um, <laughs> Uh, it's about three minutes long, so it won't take <coughs> too much of the time, and we'll very soon get to the nibbles and the wine, which I'm, I'm looking forward to myself. Um, and uh, it basically just gives you an idea of, of the work of the company. Do we have sound for this as well? We do, yeah. we do have sound, we have lights, we have everything. Okay, thank you very much. If you could roll it, please.
Okay, so that bit's over and done with. <laughs> so now we can talk, um, we can interact, we can, we can do what I'm, I'm better at doing here. Um, I hope that gave you some sort of idea of what the company is about. Dan has done all his work. Dan, uh, you, you tell me you wouldn't mind me saying this, but he's a student of ours who's, who now works full time in the film department, who is absolutely indispensable. So, do you want to ask anything or should we go and have the wine now? <laughs> No, please, I'd, I'd like to take questions and answers if there's anything. If you're still, if you've not melted completely. Yes? Uh, it's a good point, actually. Um, it's, it's often quite a difficult recruitment pr process. Um, one thing we are going to do, in, uh, indeed, is we're going to hopefully show this lecture, if it, if it records in any good state, to begin with, so that people know what we're about, because... We can put adverts in the Guardian or in the TES, um, or sometimes we go on creative, um, I think is it the creative hub or something, Art hub. arts hub and things like that. And um, people come from all sorts of different um, creative backgrounds. Some people just kind of come and they sort of say, well, um, I'm really interested in music and and I'm a musician and I work for a band, but I'd really like to do something with kids. <laughs> well, that's great, but it may not be enough. But it might, they might just have those skills that we can work on a one-to-one -one basis. So we might begin with them as a mentor and see just how, how much academic um, tuition they could do. Other times we get people with a PGCE, perhaps, or have been through mainstream education, and, and they, you know, they really want to... Um, to give their knowledge, and they want to work on a one-to-one -one basis. I have to say, it's down to the individual often, because sometimes, you know, people from who've got a PGC, they may not be the best people to work on a one-to-one -one situation. Just like um, somebody who's, who's an individual who's very, very creative probably wouldn't be able to control a class of 30 young people and do differentiated learning and all the things that you need to do in a mainstream school. You know, so it is a big job. I mean, I, I did it for 15 years myself, and I do know what it's like. Um, so, yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question. Difficultly, actually, we'll, we'll put in adverts in a number of different places. We'll bring the tutors in. And, and more and more and more, we're going through more difficult, we're looking at by maybe two or three stages of interviews before we can get a person to actually go out there. And we're now running our own going to be running our own training course, as I mentioned, which will hopefully train the tutors up. But a lot of it's, oh, we've got some tutors who've been working with us here from the very beginning, and they're fantastic now. Thank God, Emma, that you haven't left us, because <laughs> you've done some fantastic work, and Andy as well. I've got to mention him, otherwise he'll turn me on. <laughs> um, yeah? Um, I know you said you've uh, done work with no, I've got that sorry. problem too. Do you want some water? Helen's <laughs> <laughs> 16 year old. Yeah. Have you ever considered going above or, or below that, that limit? Have you thought about it? Yeah. Yeah. Older people like me. Older, yeah. Um, well, we do say uh, one of our sort of little strap lines is all ages and abilities. I mean, I say 11 to 16, that was really mainly for this little scenario that we looked at there. Um, but often we're now getting more and more young people. I think the youngest was six. Six and um, that photo that you had of everybody working yes. was actually of our primary sort of age group. That's right. The, yes. The six to ten year olds we're working at the moment. This is Chrissy. I've, I've <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we do get younger. We would love to actually um, work with uh, older people, 
perhaps do uh, work in elderly people's homes, perhaps, or on a one-to-one -one basis with you know, reminiscence and that sort of thing. I mean, it's just how far does your remit go? I have to say that um, <laughs> usually when somebody new comes into the office and they say, well, I'm going to coordinate theatre, I'm going to coordinate music, or what I'm going to, I'd really like to work, if you came into the office, for instance, and said, I'd really like to contact elderly people's homes, and I'd like to do one-to-one -one tuition with, with elderly people, we'd probably say, well, go on then, do it. <laughs> we would, actually. Um, we do say that, don't we? <laughs> and, then, and then she goes, oh, bloody hell, I've got to do it now. <laughs> she does it very well. This is Samoan, by the way, who works, uh, who coordinates um, music and theatre for us. The film is over there. I think that's fairly self-explanatory, <laughs> isn't it? Um, anything else, please? Yes? I mean, so the same uh, with both the different social services, is it like a limited number of boroughs, or is it... Um, any no, um, in a sense, the word, the word, I mean, the, the, one of the biggest boroughs is, uh, thankfully, is, uh, is Julia's, um, Julia's Southwark, I was going to say. <laughs> the renamed now. The renamed as Julia's Southwark. Um, <laughs> And uh, no, it's basically, uh, in a sense, you know, it's, it's trying to get ourselves out there. Sometimes we, we produce these glossy portfolios and, and all this stuff that tells about education. And um, sometimes I court various um, social services departments and I try and get to them and I try and work with them. And the majority of it is word of mouth. Julia will pick up the phone and... and if, Lambeth or something rings and says, is he all right? Is that company okay? She'll probably maybe tell the truth. We'll see. And then, and then they, they ref you know, they often um, clients, as we call them, will, re will begin by referring a few young people. And then if they think it works for their particular group of young people, then it starts to escalate and grow. And, and our client base is quite broad now, which is very, very good. We're, we're, we're kind of pleased with that. Um, I mean, there's a number of different boroughs that are, you know, down here, Brent, Camden, Greenwich, Hackney, Haringey, I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's whoever is out there who's got a young person. We can't always manage it. Sometimes it's difficult to get to. We work in Milton Keynes, for instance, because for some strange reason I lived there for four years. I haven't quite worked out why I did that yet. But, um, no, I still quite like it, strangely. Um, and, and we, we developed a very good relationship with the Milton Keynes Council, and we still do work there. And it's still in our business plan to, to, to keep with that work in Milton Keynes, and in fact, to look possibly at Brighton as well. But you know, in a sense, you don't want to spread yourself too th thinly. Uh, we often get a lot of competition as well. Other people set up other agencies. We don't like being called an agency. We work a partnership, we're a charity. Um, but you know, there's. Unfortunately, there's plenty of young people out of mainstream education to go around a whole load of organisations. So essentially, the more that get them back to reignite their interest in learning, the better, as far as I'm concerned, really. I, and there was a, uh, yes, one here, one there, and one there. Yes. OK, can you just give us a few examples of how you motivate students to take an interest in writing? In writing? Yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, if I do it, it'll be probably really simplistic, you know. But it might be, I mean, I, with Darren, for instance, as I say, obviously we got to Shakespeare, but the, the steps before that was probably something like, uh, oh, say, so, so you like 50 Cent. Okay, great. Um, let's look at those lyrics, and then we'll look at that. And who else do you like? And then maybe we'd go on the internet and we'll look at different rap artists. And then, then maybe I might say, Okay, but have you written any of your own original stuff? And the, the answer often is yes, because young people are interested in various issues. So we might start looking at what they've written, and without getting the red pen out and putting all the punctuation marks, we might start to say, start saying, oh, that's got an interesting rhythm. Well, that's interesting. I've got a poem here. Look how, in, you know, if it's a fairly cool poem, you know, you're not necessarily going to introduce them to Tennyson straight away, but, you know, um, have a look at that. See, see how that works. Oh, have you thought about writing about this? Instead of writing about maybe some quite difficult subjects, maybe, well, it could be really uncool to write about the environment. We'd be trying to get them onto, into a different subject, extend their vocabulary, as it were. And then maybe you might say, I don't know, oh, this is really good. Uh, we ought to write a letter. Uh, 
if you're going to get an agent, you know, you need to get an agent. Maybe you should write, write a letter. Um, and let's let, look here about letter writing skills. Let's, you know, see how we can do that. And you need to get a bit of a CV together. And, um, oh yeah, if, if, if an agent uh, picks you up, you know, they're going to take 21%. No, you don't know 21%. Oh, well, let's do percentages then. You know, it might have slipped a bit of numeracy in while we're, while we're not looking too. I don't know. We'll try. That's really simplistic, and that might have happened over several weeks. But we'll kind of still harp it. They know, you know, what you're playing at. But in a sense, you know, you'll, you'll slowly start sort of scratching away at it. And actually, kids do need to know. They know they need to know how to write and how to read and how to um, deal with their money issues and they need they know they need literacy and numeracy they know that and they're going to respond it's just in a sense of how you create that rapport with them you know now there was yes um so you were saying before that you're having more and more people turning up for who works year on year but where we're being trained, it's sort of ECM and trying to be as inclusive as possible. So if you think that all the teachers are being trained so people don't end up being all the why do you think it is that year on year you're getting more students turning up for your board? Oh, I think it's a number of different things. I mean, I don't think, I don't think they're, hmm, I don't know. I was going to say, I don't think that they're turning up at our door because more and more and more are getting excluded. I'm not too sure. I think more and more people are doing about something about the fact that they're excluded. Um, and maybe we're a bit more well known than we were before and maybe people think we're doing not, a, not such a bad job so they send an, another one to us and, and see if we can try and turn that young person around um, but I mean I, I remember um, after I left the Brit school I went on su to supply for a while because I thought it might not be a bad idea um, while I was building the company up you know and I really found that, or well, even further back than that actually, uh, I was working at Alberton School and Slaybrook School in Brent. And in those days, when, when, when a teacher didn't turn up, <laughs> and we're, we're talking those days, it's, it's kind of the days of British Raj, it's about 20 years ago. <laughs> anyway, um, in those days what would happen is, um, they'd just send the kids out, out, out of the grounds, they'd walk around the streets, get stoned and come back in. That would happen. That would really happen. And if a kid was excluded, so what? I don't know what the policy was in those days. I really don't know. I don't know. But I mean, um, ultimately, I think now there's a statutory right anyway for, for young people to get 25 hours of tuition per week. I think somebody else has a 21 and three quarters or some strange number. Depends on the case. Okay. And some councils are a little bit different. So I think some are quite attentive, like I have to say Southwark are particularly good, I'm not just saying it's Julius here, they are particularly good and their child protection policies are particularly brilliant. And so they, and we work with a number that are in the same mill. Um, and I guess the ones we don't with, work with, they either work with somebody else or they don't have those same policies. Um, so I don't know whether that answers your question. But I don't think it's, it may not be down to anything that we're kind of doing wrong in the classroom because it's, it's all those things we wrote about there. I mean, schools can be absolutely marvelous, you know. Um, and that young person's still going to reject that because it's the, it's the dynamic they've got to create with their, the, the, the other individuals in that class. Everybody's having a bloody good time but them. Everybody's having a great time, you know? They're out of it. Maybe the other kids are late in the morning because they're just because mum was a bit slow in packing their bananas and apples and sandwiches, while there's the reason that they were late is because the mum was still in bed because she was so stoned from the night before and her, the, the father was an alcoholic or whatever. Maybe they had to get themselves up and take their, their, um, their sister to school before they turned up. Maybe it's just a bit too much. I can't deal with these things. I don't know how somebody of 14 or 15 could manage that at all, actually. Though I don't know if there's anything that we can do about that. We can just, we can just um, do our best with what we've got and try and find a way of re-engaging them in, in life and, and, and in interesting learning. Was it a question or were you just yeah, pointing over? 
I'll go on too much, won't I, if you ask me a question. <laughs> the wine's coming up shortly as well. So, anything else anybody would like to ask? Yes? Um, is it always that our pastors are teaching like subjects like maths and English? As a drama teacher, we were getting into doing things like that, but I would find it really hard to teach subjects like maths. Well, we probably wouldn't let you then. It'd be all right. <laughs> No, no. Yeah, we do. We do. I mean, I, well, I mean, I say specialists. We have to look at the. Sometimes we can, and, and tutors do this. I mean, we would let you teach to certain levels. And what you would say is, and be honest about it, and we do get this, we, we'll get a, a tutor say, like, I think I've gone as far as I can go with this young person. It's all right being one step ahead, but now they're kind of pulling me, you know, and that's okay. And then we'll just try and. And, you know, Chris is very good at this in, in sort of merging it together. So essentially it kind of one tutor morphs into another one who's got the skills to take them to the next level. But, you know, that maths tutor who can do the GCSE might not be able to do what you did at the start. They really might not. And, that, and it's, a, it's a very, very um, thin tightrope to walk at times, you know that way of being professional with them and, and being a good role model, as I was saying, and at the same time, being extremely friendly and extremely eager about the world and just, in a sense, giving them that kind of contact high that the world's a great place to be in and that life is wonderful and that learning is great, you know? And if you can communicate a bit of that energy to them, you actually don't really need to say anything. It's there. And, you know, kids know if you like them or not. If you don't like kids, but you want to work with them, go and work in a sweet shop, you know? Don't be a teacher. That's what I say. Seriously. You know, if you want to see kids, but you don't like them, work in a sweet shop, because you can tell them to get out anytime you like. <laughs> it's true, though. Because they can pick up if you like them or not. You know, I mean, they're some of the most difficult, horrendous, you know, well, I don't know what, you know, descriptive words we can use. Um, I, I don't know, and the referral forms sometimes show it. You can, you can tell because they write one thing on them and they rub it out and write something else and you can see nightmare written underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But, you know, you can sort of read between the lines. And in a sense, um, yeah, they are a nightmare. They are really difficult. And, you know, they are tough and horrible, but they didn't start off like that. Nobody gets born being tough and horrible in a nightmare. Something's happened along the way. So we have to accept that. We have to screen out some of that stuff. And then we have to undercut it all, get under the skin of what's going on, show them that you like them. <laughs> One way or another, they, they'll, they'll pick up on that. And then, and then slowly, you know, you, you might spend some time um, learning about what they want to learn about. That's what you might have to spend some time. I learned a lot about Wu-Tang. Probably more than I would have liked to have known. <laughs> I can't quite get it out of my head, actually. Which place is your favourite Sorry? Who's your favourite Wu member? Old Dirty Bastard, actually. Really? Yeah. <laughs> See? I thought Rizzo was okay, but he went a bit off the rail. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. yes uh, what sort of training do your tutors and um, mentors receive? Well, um, we're actually stepping it up more and more because we're actually dealing with more and more difficult situations, we think. Um, we used to do a kind of one, once a term sort of training sessions. It's going to be once a month now. And um, we're changing our reporting system to more of a planning system. There's some tutors out there <laughs> thinking to themselves, oh my God, I'll come to you in a second. Yes. Um, so, yeah, we do... Um, we are planning, in fact, to do far more, where we're actually looking to, um, obviously, we're looking at new policies on education, but we look at managing challenging behaviour, um, we look at using resources appropriately, we look at finding ways to engage young people using creative means. There's a whole range of different things that we do. Um, at the moment, we're looking to possible physical intervention and restraining, which is something that we've held off from, from a long, long point. But actually now, because we're doing quite a lot of small group situations, we're about to get uh, become trainers ourselves professionally so we can cascade, so in all the terms, we can cascade this information down. So, you can, yeah. Stop. 
Yes. Can I, can I just say a really warm okay. thanks, Bill, for, for, for what you've introduced us tonight in terms of the work of your company? It's really been very insightful, very human, I think, and very sensitive. Um, I was talking to a German visitor today who, I, I don't have much human, but I think he used the term um, Liebenskunst, Liebenskunst, which is to do with this notion of the art for living. Right. And it seems to me that what, what you're about is, we don't, we have a clumsy way of interpreting that in England, it seems to me, but it seems to me, wrapped up in that German term, is what you're about, you know, getting children to engage with life. Sorry, it's Liebenskunst, Lieben Life Kunst Art. Um, getting children to engage with, with, with life from very, very difficult background and circumstances. And I think this is terrific, and it's the kind of values that we would want to, um, all of our students doing teacher training courses at, at Goldsmiths, and I think across the country, we, we would want them to take these kind of values with them into the classroom. So thanks ever so much for talking. Thank you. More than merrier. We're down in Brick Lane. Pop <laughs>